more or less right from where we were yesterday. So the fact that we basically got through yesterday before that power outage means we're still on track as far as covering material. We're still looking at optimization. And optimization is still kind of finding maximum or minimum values in an upside setting. And we did one example where we just sort of gave a, gave a function and we're like, okay, here you go. Find the, find the max of this function. Um, maybe one more example like that. Another kind of classic example, which is the drug reaction curve. So where X is the milligrams of a drug administered, and Y is the strength of the reaction. And we're probably not used to this, but Y is a unitless variable. So Y is just a number. It doesn't have any unit. It's like when your doctor asks you to rate the pain on a scale from 1 to 10. You're just giving them a number. And these things vary, of course. And my calculus class is not medical advice, but sometimes you see drug reaction curves that look like this, and they don't react in maybe the way you would intuitively expect them to. So for a while they do, as the strength of the dosage increases, the drug reaction also increases. But then, if the dosage gets too big, the strength of the drug reaction goes back down again. Um, like, I don't know if, um, if any of you read, like, Agatha Christie stuff like that. You sort of sometimes encounter this in mystery novels. The, um, if you were, this is not medical advice, but if you're trying to poison somebody <coughs> and you put too much of a poison, it might actually have very little reaction. You sometimes see that. Well, I don't want my calculus class to get too grim. You sometimes see that when people attempt suicide using sleeping drugs, because some sleeping drugs have this property, that if you overdose, you'll just kind of feel lousy next morning. But the drug reaction will be fairly minimal. So, assuming we're looking at a drug like that, there's nothing more natural than the question, how many milligrams should be administered. <coughs> to max 
maximize the reaction. And let me copy, well, heck, even though it's kind of, if I just work in this frame, I'll have plenty of space. Let's copy that function over, 0.5x. And now this is kind of similar to the situation we're in yesterday, where we're definitely looking, what on earth, there we go, where we're definitely looking for an absolute maximum, but it's not necessarily evident immediately um, how to use the tools of section 4.1. I mean in section 4.1 we are assuming that we're on a closed interval from A to B. And that actually is true here, but I don't think it's necessarily obvious that this function is defined on this closed interval. And as with the example yesterday, you're usually going to end up graphing these things. I mean, Textbook author can sort of kvetch, uh, assuming that, assuming that our wireless is back on and we have access. Okay, I think if I just type this in, okay, good. Let's share this so that it shows up in the recording and for online students. And let's take a look at 0.05x sqrt. You can also, by the way, um, there's, go to press this button and there is a square root button. But the square root of, let's see, what was it? I've lost it. Point 0.5, not point zero 0.05. And then it's 20 minus x. Point zero 0.05, 20 minus x. So, Here's what the curve looks like. And we are, for intents and purposes, on a closed interval here, right? I mean, X is a drug dosage. X is not going to be negative. So this curve is only defined between 0 and 20. And that's because of this square root. 20 minus x has to be positive. Um, and Desmos very uh, helpfully does just tell us where this maximum is. But let's approach this as a classroom exercise. So let's get some experience messing around with these critical values. So now that we've graphed it, we can see we're on a closed interval, but we can also see that there is a maximum here between 10 and 15. And we can see that this maximum is also a relative maximum or a local maximum, if I haven't used that phrase before. 
So if we can find a local extrema, a local maximum, between about 10 and 15, that's also going to be the absolute maximum we're looking for. And I said this yesterday, but the power was off. Let me say it now for the recording as well. That's how most of these applied optimization problems end up working. You are looking for an absolute extrema, but you end up using the techniques of section 4.3, finding local extrema. This is, this is now a cross between a calculus and an algebra problem. We need to find a derivative, that's calculus, but then we need to set the derivative equal to zero to find the critical values. And that's algebra. So, as far as the calculus goes, <clears throat> this isn't like <clears throat> super obscure. It's something I could have put on the um, on the second test. But let's try to be careful here and not make not make any of those little errors that are so easy to make when you've got these lengthy problems. Let me first emphasize that a square root is a power. We need that, and I always find it helpful to do that bit of rewriting. And we've got a product. product. We've got 0 0.05x times the square root. f prime of x equals. Okay, product rule. It's been a while, maybe, because most of our applications or most of our examples have been pretty straightforward derivatives, but this stuff never goes away. The derivative of that first function times the second function plus and now we leave the first function alone. And when we take the derivative of the second function, a few things happen. I mean, this one half goes down. That's the power rule. One half gets reduced by one. Again, that's the power rule. And we multiply by the derivative of the inside function, and the derivative of 20 minus x is negative 1. That's the chain rule. And I'm just going to take advantage of the fact that it's easy to erase on this whiteboard and do that. And that's the derivative, and that's what we want to set equal to zero. Um, not a trivial thing to do by any means. It sometimes happens in these calculus classes that the calculus is sort of not the hardest part of the problem. It's the algebra that you really need to um, be careful of. 
but see what we can do. I guess the first thing to recognize, and I have not done, did not do this problem before class because there was a power outage all of yesterday, so we're learning together here. Um, this is a fraction, is my first thought. Remember that having a negative power is the same as having a positive power. inside um inside the denominator of a fraction and i'm also Combining our constants here, 0 0.05 times 1 half should be 0 0.025. So, here we don't have a fraction. It's just 0 0.05 times the square root of 20 minus x. And we want this to be zero. And there are probably a few different ways we could do this. Um, in fact, there are definitely a few different ways we could do this. Um, that's in Ceylon in Math 101 would be yelling at me to clear the denominator of this fraction. So maybe that's what we'll do. And by clearing the denominator of the fraction, what I mean is that we can take both sides of this equality and multiply it by this denominator. The square root of 20 minus x. And on the right, see if this Let's see if we can do this without a lot more copying. But, but tell me if you have questions. If we multiply this whole thing by that square root, that multiplication distributes over that subtraction. So we're multiplying that by the square root. And we're multiplying that by the square root. Everyone agree so far? A square root times a square root cancels the square root out. So when we have this square root times the same square root, the square root cancels, and we get 20 minus x. Over here, multiplying by the denominator gets rid of it. Over on the left, multiplying 0 by anything is still zero, and we have this equation that is now relatively straightforward to solve. And um, you'll notice in particular, there's now only one x floating around. 
Does everybody have everything on this frame copied down that they need copied down? If so, I don't know, I guess, that this is really faster than just going to another frame and recopying that, but let's bring that up to the top of the frame. Let me see. It's my day to be forgetting zeros, apparently. And now we're going to want our calculator in just a moment. Let's see. Zero point. 0, 0.05 times 20 is 1. Am I thinking about that right? 5 one hundredths times 20 is 100 one hundredths. So this ought to be 1 minus 0 0.05x minus 0 0.025. I thought maybe working with a fraction would be nicer. Let's keep these decimals. 1 minus 0 0.025. Um, point nine seven five eraser. Add point zero five X to both sides. And then all oh, that mental arithmetic. And I still have to use the calculator in the last step anyway. Point nine seven five divided by point zero five. Is that what I was expecting? Not really. Great. And now it's one of these things where, okay, there was an error here somewhere. I erased all my work. I think we're just going to have to uh, not find the error with all of my work erased. Ah, uh, well, that's disappointing. Well, what we get x equals, let's at least write down the answer we got. 0.975 divided by 0 0.05. We got 9. Point five. Actual answer was about thirteen point three. I hate making errors in front of the class, but 
There is not a lot that I can concretely do about this, except move on to the next example. Sorry about that. Alas, we made a mistake and did not finish that problem. Well, buck up. Still have the rest of the class, so can't let this bother us too much. Um, let's look. I don't want to dwell on this. But let's look at an applied optimization problem where we are not giving equations. And the reason I don't want to dwell on this is that these examples often end up being very kind of fakey and very kind of, you have a parabola and you are inscribing a square into it and you want to maximize the volume of the square, kind of very, uh, very fakey questions. But it would be good to see an example. So here's kind of a the classic example that every textbook uses to introduce this material. It goes something like you are creating a rectangular garden. One side of garden will be the wall of your house. The other three sides will be wire. So a wire fence. And because the protagonist of these applied optimization problems can never go to the store, they apparently have to make do with what they have lying around. Let's say that's 300 feet of wire fencing. What is the maximum area of the garden? And it's probably pretty clear, but let's make it explicit. The difference between this problem and this problem, I mean, aside from the fact that I intend to finish this problem correctly, but the mathematical difference is we're not given a formula here. We're just sort of, here's what we're trying to do, here's what we have, try to figure this out. And there's no one-size-fits-all solution to problems like 
this. I mean, we, if we're going to approach this using calculus, we are going to have to take a derivative of something, right? Maximum values occur where the derivative is zero. So, in particular, if we want to find a maximum of the area, then we want the derivative of the area to equal zero. But what is the area? We can't take a derivative of the area until we have a function for the area. And as I say, there's no one-size-fits-all kind of way of approaching this. We'll just have to work it out as best we can. So let's consider what we are looking at here. We've got the wall of a house. And we have the three sides of a rectangular garden. And we are looking at the area of this region. Any thoughts? This isn't really a trick question, but I can see how it might not be obvious because I haven't labeled anything. I mean, the only form though we have for the area of a rectangle is the width times the height. So if we call this the width and this the height, This is the only form to the, for the area that we really have. So it's presumably the form to the that we need to use. But we can't take the derivative of this. Or at least it's really not <coughs> obvious how to take the derivative of this. We have two variables here. X is a variable and Y is a variable. And in all of calculus so far, we've never learned how to work with multiple variables. If we had a of x, we could differentiate to that. Or, probably quicker to just use the erase tool, but if we had a of y, we could differentiate that. But we have two variables here, a of x and y. And you would have to take calculus Three with Mr. Vogel, if you want to know how to deal with expressions that have multiple variables. So, what can we do? Sort of thinking out loud here, we have two variables. 
We can only perform calculus if we have one variable. We need to get rid of one of these variables somehow. And now let's stop and think some more. What piece of information have we been given that we haven't used in this problem? 300. 300. We were told how much fencing there was. And we haven't yet used that piece of information. So could you do like one side equals x and then one the other side equals like x squared? I wouldn't do that exactly. I think this, I mean, that's the good, the right idea, I think. One side equals x. On the other side, I'd say, Lord, some days. I mean, I would say that this side and this side are equal, and this side is not equal. We're not told that this is a square, so the y could be different from x. And what I would say is that we're told that all of these three sides together make up 300. The length of the top side plus the length of the bottom side plus the length of the right side equals the total length, and the total length of this wire fencing is 300. And we're, again, we're not counting this other side because this is the house. We don't have to fence the left side. And let me Let me give us some room to work. Not going to erase all of this in case I need to refer back to it. I've learned my lesson, but A equals XY, and X plus X plus Y equals 300. <coughs> x plus x is 2x, and we've still got this goal to get rid of x or Y. So we can take the derivative of this A. So now that we have a relationship between X and Y, you might have seen this type of thing before, like if you ever learned how to solve systems of linear equations, and you might have been taught the substitution method. What we could do is we could say, well, if 2x plus y equals 300, then y is 300 minus 2x. We're just subtracting 2x from both sides here. And we can take 
that y, and we can plug it into the equation. And the point of doing this is that suddenly we only have one variable. From having x's and y's, we've gone to just having x. And we can differentiate. Let me, let me go to Desmos. This is always my first port of call. Get rid of that. So we've got x. Times 300 minus 2x. And we can't see much of anything, but if we mess around with our viewing window, here's what this area function looks like. <clears throat> and there is a maximum, and this maximum is a local maximum, so we could find it, or we can find it, using the first derivative. This is, let me see, here's 50, 100. So it looks like somewhere between 50 and 100, this maximum occurs. Let's see if we can find a critical value somewhere between 50 and 100. To find the critical values, we need to take the derivative, and I guess we could just sort of blunder in with the product rule. I mean, we've got something times something else, but probably the easiest way to approach this is by distributing. That's 300x minus 2x squared. And a prime then is 300 minus 4x and we set a prime equal to zero because we're looking for critical values. Three hundred equals four x. Three hundred divided by four, seventy five. Beautiful. Here's fifty, here's a hundred, midway between fifty and a hundred, just like we see on the graph. And we could use the first derivative test to tell us this is a local maximum. It, I mean, the steps we've taken render that a bit silly. I mean, by the time we've sketched a graph of this thing and we're looking at this and going, yup, there's the maximum between 75 and 100. I don't know if you really need to use the first derivative test to, to verify that.
but here is the value that maximizes the area, which is not what we were asked for, um, to be clear. So we're not quite done. We were asked, what's the maximum area? Well, the area is x times y, and y equals 300 minus 2x. X is 75. I hope I'm not falling down on the finish line. 75 times 2 should be 150. 300 minus 150 should be 150. And the area which is x times y is then 75 times 150. Eleven thousand two hundred fifty square feet. So that was an example of an applied optimization problem where you weren't given a form to the and you kind of had to work it through. Um let's see. I think we're I'll take a look at the quiz, but I think we're probably done with applied optimization. We'll finish set chapter four on Thursday, and we'll also, I guess, plan on getting you the test Thursday. Uh, no class Wednesday, that scholastic competition. So I will see you Thursday.